This is my Bible. It is the Word of God, and it is the will of God for my life. I am who the Word says I am. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm where the Word says I am, seated right now in the heavenly realms, in Christ Jesus, in the place of authority, dominion, and power. I have what the Word says I have. All the blessings of Abraham are mine, and I can do what the Word says I can do. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Today my mind is alert. My spirit is receptive. As I'm taught the Word of God, my life has changed for the better, and I will never be the same again. Amen. Give five people a high five, and then you may be seated this morning. Well, thank you for joining us live. Those watching online, be sure to click share so we can get the message out to as many people as we can. We're marching through the book of 1 John, and this is part five of that series. The past couple of Sundays, we've seen from 1 John chapter 2 that we demonstrate our faith in God by our obedience. I mean, if you didn't believe, why would you obey? So we demonstrate, we demonstrate our faith in God by our obedience, and we demonstrate our love for God by our obedience. We've also seen that our love for God is proven by our obedience, and our faith in God is proven by our obedience. 1 John 2, verse 3, we know that we have come to know him if. And I learned many, many years ago, decades ago, that when you see the word if in the Bible, stop and meditate on it, because it's a big deal. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. And then last Sunday, we saw the command that we as believers are not to love the world or anything in the world. I think everywhere we look, we see that just too many people are in love with the world. And too many ministers, churches, are imitating the world. We're not supposed to imitate the world. We're supposed to win the world to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 2, 15, do not love the world or anything in the world. And I think over the years, people have misunderstood us. You know, God has blessed us with some things, but we're not in love with things. Anybody that really un understands us and knows us, I mean, if we had to decide between keeping our cars versus uh, grandchildren going to public school, we just go to selling stuff. So God has blessed us. We have some stuff, but we're not in love with the stuff. Can you understand that? And so we're grateful. We thank God for the stuff, but we're not in love with the stuff. Amen. Stuff can be replaced. Human beings... Uh, we can't, and, and when, when human beings get led astray and messed up, it can be very difficult to get that human being back on track. And what they're doing is so egregious. But anyway, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So it's not just highly recommended to not love the world or anything in the world. It's really, in, it's either, it's an either or situation. If we love the world, we don't love the Father. If we love the Father, we can't love the world. Now, we can enjoy things in the world. You know, Sue was showing me on her phone, a wonderful family in the church, and they were on vacation a couple of months back. And, you know, so we can go and we can enjoy and we can buy something, and we can drive it, we can vacation, but we're not to love the world or anything in the world. Verse 16, for everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. And so, boasting. Tell your neighbor, Christians should not be boasters. And when you boast... Boast on the Lord. Amen. Amen. 
You know, if you got something to crow about, well, give the Lord the credit, the glory, and the honor. Verse 17, the world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Now, that's fascinating because the modern apostasy is it doesn't matter what you do. But yet John wrote, the man who does the will of God lives forever. Let's shift gears then and hit new ground. First John chapter 2, verse 28. And let's spend our time this morning talking about how we are children of God. Now, we've been pointing out that <clears throat> even though people that are teaching this new apostasy, which is actually an old apostasy, it's, it's kind of a train wreck between Marcionism and antinomianism, um, they, they deny that 1 John was written to believers. And so we've been pointing out every Sunday, nearly every chapter, John says, my dear children. So obviously, 1 John was written to believers, and here we see it again, 1 John 2, 28, and now, dear children, continue in him. And you know, it's like we got to say, stop, hold the phone, because if he says continue in him, why would he say continue in him if it were possible to not continue in him? Amen. I mean, how about just being honest? Amen. And that's why I like a translation of the Bible that's not a paraphrase and yet is modern and is easy to read, but not a paraphrase. I like paraphrase Bibles. I got them at home but I don't go by that day by day. I go by a modern, accurate translation. And the reason is because if, if you're honest, see, if a lot of times if you use something like the King James only, it can be confusing to you, and so you ignore it. But when you read a translation, not a paraphrase, but an accurate translation, and you're honest, well, you're going to have to deal with some things. And here's one. And now, dear children, so he's writing to dear children. Who's he talking to? Unbelievers or believers? He says, continue in him. Now, why would he give the exhortation to continue in him if it were not possible to not continue in him? And now, dear children, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. I mean, if you heard the trumpet blast right now, would your first thought be praise the Lord or would your first thought be, oh my gosh, I've been into this and I've been into that and I got stuff I need to repent of. So he says, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident, confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. So can you see why obviously they hate First John? Because he says, does, everyone who does what is right has been born of him. All right, and I learned from one of my daddies in the faith, Dr. Frederick K.C. Price, to turn the coin over and say, well, what is the word not saying? If John says, everyone who does what is right has been born of him, well, we turn the coin over. He's saying, everyone who does not do what is right has not been born of him. Amen. And that's why Jesus taught us to be fruit inspectors. These modern apostates, these heretics say it doesn't matter what we do, but the Apostle John says everyone who does what is right has been born of him. Now this same topic con continues into chapter 3, verse 1. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and get somewhere this morning with this because in various cars I'm listening to different things from I mean, so I listen to some John Osteen, I listen to some Fred Price, but generally it's Kenneth E. Hagan, the one that went to be with the Lord in 2003. And in a lot of messages, he talks about how that Christians uh, have had a prejudice when it comes to healing, when it comes to success, when it comes to prosperity. And the prejudice is to say, well, that, that was for the Jews, and especially on prosperity. That was for the Jews. And uh, we know anybody that's been in Faith Christian Center a while knows from Galatians 3. And is Galatians 3 in the New Testament or the Old Testament? Galatians 3, Christ redeemed us 
from the curse of the law so that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. So I can go there, I can go to Galatians 3 and find out that the reason Christ died, the reason Christ came, the reason he sacrificed himself was so that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. So when a Christian has a prejudice, that was for the Jews, success was for the Jews, prosperity was for the Jews, healing was from the Jews, keeping us well from sickness and disease was for the Jews. Well, I can just blow that off. That's nonsense. That is a prejudice that is not based on the written word of God. Because I see that he did what he did. He redeemed us from the curse of the law so that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles. Now I read over here in 1 John 3, 1, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. So we are the children of God. And a lot of people don't, see, if you don't understand who you are, well, then you have trouble approaching him. You know, I notice with my grandchildren, they don't, they don't really ask for anything. You know, it doesn't matter what clan they're from. They just come in and as, as from the time they're big enough and strong enough to pull the door on the pantry, they just go in there, man, and they just get what they want. And then when they're big enough and strong enough to pull the door on the refrigerator or the freezer, they don't beg, you know, they're not beggars. They, they, because they have this idea that, you know, uh, sukasa mikasa. In other words, uh, if it's yours, it's mine, amen? In other words, if it's yours, by extension, it's theirs. That's just the way they think. But too many of God's people don't understand. They think that we are going to be children of God, that, that it is going to happen, that the miracles are going to happen, that, that healing is going to happen, that the blessing is going to happen. And they take all of the good stuff of the Word of God, they shove it off in the future, and the problem is if you take all the promises and the blessings of the Word of God and you shove them off in the future, well, you don't get to walk in any promises and blessings right now. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen? Can I get a better amen? amen? How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God and that is what we are. Notice he does not say that is what we are going to be. Say it out loud, we are, we are right, now, right now children, children of, the of the living God. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, again, he reiterates. So it must have been in his spirit, it must have been on the mind of the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit was giving him these words. Dear friends, now we are children of God. You know, a lot of people, because of this prejudice, well, that was for the Jews. When God does come along and bless them, they feel bad about it. And that was something that the Lord helped me deal with in the 90s. Actually, before the 90s. That when the Lord blesses me, and I feel bad about it, I'm actually hindering him from blessing me again. We are to have faith like children. Jesus said, unless you have faith like a child, you won't even be able to enter the kingdom of heaven. So we ought to have a childlike faith. That's my daddy, and he wants me to have it, so, you know, I'm cool with it, amen? amen. And then it doesn't matter what somebody else says, you know, I notice all these critics, they're not helping me. Amen. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. So we don't really understand what we will be. It's kind of hard to understand, isn't it? Jesus eating uh, fish for a meal and then walking through a wall, that is physics at a level we don't understand. I mean, if he was spooky as a ghost, we could understand that, but then how did he eat the fish? 
and we can understand him eating the fish, but then how did he go? How did he disappear out of the room? Did the fish stick on the wall when he went through the wall? It's physics at a different level. Now we don't understand it. And that's what John says. What we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when he appears, see, we, we may not understand it all, but we know this, that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So that is what is ahead. Becoming like him, having a resurrected body like him. That is what is ahead. But being the children of God, that is not ahead. That is right now. Can you see it? So there's some stuff coming up that I can't walk in today. But because there's some stuff coming up I can't walk in today doesn't mean that I ought to take all the good promises and blessings of the word and shove them off into the future because there are some things God has for me to walk in today because I'm a child of God. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself. Oh my goodness, no wonder they hate 1 John. Now can we really make ourselves worthy? No. Do we have a part to play? Yes. Can you see that? I mean, I'm sure there are people here this morning and you broke a habit without God's help. And I'm sure there are people here this morning and there were other habits you broke with God's help. But if you don't break the habit, it's just going to go on and on and on and on. purifies himself. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Sin, and this is what's going on in our culture and country today, is it is a refusal to acknowledge that God has any right to tell me what not to do. And so they're literally inventing new ways to break God's laws. Sin is lawlessness. It's a spirit. Just as he is pure, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness, but you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins and in him is no sin. Verse six, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. Say, ouch. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. It's a big deal because, you know, <laughs> it's really sad. But what, it could be family. It could be somebody you know at work. But we probably, everybody in the room knows somebody. And they're a Christian, but they don't act like it. Now, we understand a baby Christian not acting like a mature Christian. But when is it acceptable for even a baby Christian to be a liar or a murderer or to murder with the tongue? And so the problem is, see, when people sit in churches and they're not being taught the word of God, they don't even know that God has any standards. God has standards. I remember we were coming back from Africa preaching and we were staying in a hotel in London and some way, somehow, they gave us a great suite and we thought we'd go down and have some tea. We go down and uh, say, well, we'd like to have tea. And they walked us in there and they seated us. And about six minutes later, a guy comes by and he says, sir, you don't have a, you don't have a coat on. I said, well, I didn't know I needed a coat. And the guy didn't tell us when he seated us. He said, well, you got to have a coat on to have tea in here. That's a, that's a hotel restaurant in London. And they have standards. And yet people think they're going to spend eternity with God in heaven. And there's no standards. People are amazing. 
standards. And just because the culture has given up on standards, you know, first time I ever flew was when my father's older brother passed away. I, I, I don't remember what year that was, 71, 72, 73. Men got dressed to fly. I mean, people wore suits to, to, to fly. And Sue was on a flight yesterday and the lady in front of her had a support dog. Sue was wondering why the plane smelled like dog. You know, and, and we've seen all manner of behavior on airplanes, people clipping their toenails on airplanes. My point is, people get this in their head that because there's no standards in society today that you can bring that over to God and God has no standards. God has standards. <laughs> I remember, you know, a guy, I never heard him play. I don't think I ever heard him play. He was supposed to be a fabulous pianist, but... You know, he found out that to play at Faith Christian Center, he had to do laying a firm foundation and be a part of the church nine months. And, you know, he said, well, that's it. I'm out of here. And, and then a guy that was supposed to be a great singer, I never heard him sing, same thing. They're, they're just horrified that you have standards. Well, the Apostle Paul said, know them that labor among you. Amen. And we're, we're not trying to do anything to anybody, but we are trying to not put people in leadership that are going to embarrass us later. Amen. Standards. Tell your neighbor, God still has standards. God still has standards. Everyone who breaks the laws, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness, but you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who keeps, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen or known him. And a lot of times people might have a cursory experience with God, but that doesn't mean that they're really born again. Kenneth Hagin, the one that went to be with the Lord in 2003, said, hanging out in church doesn't make you a Christian any more than hanging out in the garage makes you a Chevrolet. There has to be a change on the inside. Verse 7, dear children... And again, he's calling us children, dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. Now, why would he write to dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray, unless it were possible for children, children of God, to be led astray? And so we see that it's possible to be led astray. Now, what's he going to warn us about? Do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. And he who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Now, I take this and I compare it to what Jesus said about being a, a fruit inspector. By their fruit you shall know them. Now, we're not, we're not wishing harm on anybody. We're not trying to do anything to anybody. But God gave us brains and God gave us eyes and God gave us what Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. And he gave us eyes to read this and a brain to see it. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. <clears throat> he who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And then I take that back to something the Lord pointed out to me about some of these ministers two, maybe three Sundays ago. They're not even doers of the word at the Psalm 1 level. See, we have to be discriminating in our fellowship. Amen. You know, and I use this illustration with my family. What would Sue think if I, if, I, if I didn't start going to strip joints, but I started hanging out with guys who went to strip joints? Well, I'm not going myself. And that's why we've had to put some distance between us and some ministers. And, and there are responses, well, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm not going there. I'm not doing, yeah, but you're hanging out with those who are doing that. <laughs> My daughter got connected to a girl at St. Paul's. It wasn't somebody out in the world. It was a girl at St. Paul's, a man you know, just started having the worst attitude. 
If you're watching, Christina, I love you. <laughs> and then we went round and round and round and round and round. Lip, attitude. And you know, they get to a point where eh, you got to find other ways to punish them. You know, especially girls. It'd just be a shame, you know, to get a switch out and whip a 14-year-old girl. So you have to find other ways to punish them. Lip and attitude and attitude and lip. Now, fast forward all these years, you know, my daughter has a wonderful life, a wonderful husband, wonderful family, and the girl that was sowing the seeds of bad attitude in her is just one, it's just a train wreck. Because your attitude is going to determine how your life turns out. Amen. You got a lousy, stinking attitude. How many of you are in management? Let me see your hand if you're in management. You hire or fire where you work. Let me see your hand. If somebody comes in and you, they, they snooker you and they get past you and you hire them and then you find out they just got a lousy, stinking attitude, what do you do? You tell them you're making a change. Why? Because it will infect everybody around them. So we just had to deal with it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Sue, Sue's gotten tougher as the decades have gone by, but at that point in time, that point in time, you know, she was still the kind of little old Miss Mercy. And so it took me a little bit of effort to get her on board. But, you know, we're not having this. I'm not having this. I'm not having it. I'm not having it. Behavior is everything. And that's why when children are little, you can't just let them run around like little wild wolves. You have to guide them in their behavior. I mentioned lying. You let a child lie, they're going to grow up and be a liar. You let a child give you attitude or lip, they're going to do that the rest of their life. So this is called parenting. The point is, the point is, if we have been born again any length of time at all, our behavior ought to reflect our Father God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our behavior ought not reflect the world. Amen. We ought not look like the world and talk like the world and behave like the world. Now, there are times... You know, every night before I go to sleep, typically I call names of people that have a beef with me for whatever reason, and I say, bless them, Lord, bless them, bless them, Lord. I call their names, bless them, bless them, Lord. People that have tried to hurt us, bless them, Lord, bless them. Why would I do that? Do I feel like doing that? No, I don't feel like doing that. But I do intend to be a doer of the word of God. And Jesus said, bless those who persecute you. Bless those who despitefully use you. And I know this, I want to be on the right side of things with the Lord. Amen. Amen. But my point is, there is just entirely too much of this no standard, no bars, hold, do whatever you want thinking in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to operate, we ought to live at a different level from the world. You know, I was horrified. Austin was telling me about somebody who works in events backstage, coordinating events, you know, the mechanics of all this. And one of the most famous ministers in America got done with his message at this conference and went backstage and uh, down two shots. And the handler told the people around, it's okay, it's okay, it's under control. Look, maybe some hot tea with some honey and lemon, maybe a cappuccino. You know, if I'm really needing an energy boost, maybe a double espresso. But there's no reason for a minister of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to be throwing down shots. Amen. Standards. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. And so when they tell you it doesn't matter what you do, they're leading you astray. When they tell you that God has no standards, they're leading you astray. When they're telling you that uh, the moral law of God is gone, they're leading you astray. When they tell you 
that the Ten Commandments are no longer in effect, they're leading you astray. When they tell you that you don't ever have to confess a sin to God or ask God's forgiveness for a sin, they're leading you astray. And if you really stop and think about it, what they're doing is they're putting you in neutral. And we have learned at Faith Christian Center that faith is released by taking action on the Word of God. So when, when somebody tells you it doesn't, you don't have to do anything, you don't do anything, you live your life in neutral, you'll never get another answer to prayer. You'll never get another miracle. You'll never experience the blessing of God again. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Say, everybody say it out loud. The reason the, reason. the Son of God appeared of God was to destroy, was to destroy the, devil's the devil's work. And actually, that is the definition of ministry. Whether it is casting out devils or laying hands on the sick or teaching and training people in the Word of God, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. So that is what ministry is. We are to be setting the captive free, healing the sick, amen, bringing deliverance. Amen. No one who is born of God will continue to sin. Oh my gosh, no one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Everybody grab your head with both hands and say, oh my goodness. How about just using this right here when your teenage children bring friends home? And I know daddy, I know daddy, you know, he cusses all the time. I know daddy, you know, he came up, he came drunk last time to pick me up. I know, but, but he's a Christian. I know his eyes are dilated all the time, daddy, but, but he's a Christian. But these same people, if they went to buy a dog, man, they'd want, they'd want papers. They'd want to know what they were buying. But when it comes to their daughter bringing a boy home or their son bringing a daughter home, they just, man, they just take it all in faith. He's, yeah, he's a Christian. But now I got to have a registered dog to be messing with my dog. I, I got to know, know where of they're coming from. You got to check the bona fides. Amen. Are they in church? What church? The first church of whoredom? I said, what church? This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Look, I learned a long time back. Just because a plumber has a fish on his business card does not make that plumber a Christian plumber. And actually, in my life experience, I'm actually more wary of somebody that's got a fish on their business card. Because why are they using Jesus to push their business? Although the Lord's convicting me, I had a guy at the house this week, does excellent work, just excellent work. And he had, it wasn't a fish, but it was something on his truck to let people know he was a believer. So you just can't go, but you got to go by the fruit. You can't go by what the truck says. Amen. Oh, said in God we trust on his truck. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God. <laughs> Say, tell your neighbor, of course they hate 1 John. The tell the neighbor on the other side, of course they hate 1 John. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. Track record, track record, track record. And it's, it's not just track record. You know, I stand out there and I see jailhouse tats. And, you know, if you watch me, you know, you'll see me smile because we are to destroy the works of the devil. So it's not like, what is the ancient history on this person? It is more like, what is the recent history on this person? 
Can you see that? Amen. And I don't know if you've figured it out, but life is not a sprint. Life is a marathon. It's how you finish that counts. Amen. I just read through Ezekiel. It's frightening because it talks about how a man can start out living for God and turn and all of his good works will be forgotten. A man can start out living in rebellion against God, turn and live for God and all the rebellions forgotten. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. Now let's go back, and if I have time, let us go back to chapter 3, verse 2. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And maybe. Let's go over to Matthew 15. Matthew 15, picking up in verse 21. Matthew 15, 21, leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. That's outside of Israel, by the way. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out loud, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word, so his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. And somebody might have a problem with this, but on another occasion, Jesus said salvation is of the Jews. Here he says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Verse 25, the woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Now, <laughs> That's kind of tough, coming from the Son of God that the world likes to pretend is nothing but a sissy. But I got no problem with it because I don't have any problem with the Bible. That's what he said. He said, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. So what was he calling healing? Talk to me. What was Jesus calling healing? Now, and if you stop and think about it, he's saying to this Syrophoenician woman, this Canaanite, this is reserved for children, and you ain't one of them. Can you see that? Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. So she didn't get offended. She wouldn't do well in churches in America in 2022. I had a guy leave one time because I got highlights in my hair. I mean, people are amazing. They get offended over the most ridiculous things and the things that should offend them, they don't get offended over. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. Your, your request is granted, and her daughter was healed from that very hour. So this was on my mind all week long, in and out of this, studying for this morning, 1 John 2, 1 John 3, and I kept going to Matthew 15. I didn't know if I would get there this morning. But if you're here this morning, and you need a healing in your body, I want you to see from the Word of God, 1 John 3, verse 2, dear friends, now we are children of God. And in Matthew 15, what did Jesus call healing? What did Jesus call healing? Children's bread. So who does healing belong to? And then we started out, I pointed out Galatians chapter 3, the reason Christ came was so that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles. So we are the children of God. That's why I started out talking about how that in a lot of his messages, Kenneth Hagin would talk about this prejudice Christians have with regard to success and prosperity and healing. Well, that's for the Jews. That's for the Jews. That's for the Jews. And now you fast forward all these years and Christians don't have anything hardly, most Christians, because they had a prejudice. Same thing here. Now, he says, dear children, over and over and over and over. And he says, now we are 
the children of God. Look, if you'll meditate on it, renew your mind to it, it'll change your life because you come to see that you are a child of the king and you deserve every good thing that he has for you. You deserve success. You deserve prosperity. You deserve healing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I wanted to get to this point Wednesday night, but I, I ran out of time. I'm running out of time right now. I don't even know how I'm going to do it. But if you're here this, everybody in the room, let's stand. Everybody in the room, let's stand. If you're here this morning and you need healing in your body, I want you to make your way up to the front, to this corner. Come to this corner. Austin's going to anoint you with oil. I'm going to lay hands on you. And here's what I want you to do. Don't just do it to see what happens. If you're coming to see what happens, don't bother. I said, if you're coming to see what happens, don't bother. Come releasing your faith. And say to yourself, Matthew 8, 17, Jesus took up my infirmities and bore my diseases. 1 Peter 2, 24, with his stripes I have been healed. That's what I'd be saying. But you know what else I'd be saying? When he, when he anoints me with oil, I believe I'll receive. When pastor lays hands on me, I believe I'll receive. Do you understand? You have to release your faith. What is the anointing of oil? It's a point of contact. It's almost a kind of a prayer of agreement. It's a point of contact that when he anoints me with oil, I'll be healed. What is the laying on of hands? Same thing. It's a kind of prayer of agreement. And it is a point of contact. You release your faith. When he lays his hands on me, I'll be healed. Are you getting it? Amen. You're too quiet. Amen. Amen. Now, so I expect everybody in that line to be talking. If you're not talking, I may not lay hands on you. And don't be talking about your problem. Say, but with his stripes I have been healed. Jesus took up my infirmities and bore my diseases. Thank you, Father God, I'm healed. Thank you, Father God, I'm well. Thank you, Father God, I'm whole. Everybody in the room, let's start praising the Lord. Tell, start, start telling the Lord. Don't tell the Lord about your problem. The Lord knows about your problem. Tell the Lord what the Word says. Hallelujah. Are you hearing me? Lift up your voice. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And put a smile on your face. Amen. We're not going to bury your dog here. Put a smile on your face because good stuff's coming. Say it out loud. Healing is the children's bread. Jesus took up my infirmities, bore my diseases. With his stripes, I am healed. Hallelujah. When he lays hands on me, I'll be healed by the power of God. I believe I receive healing. Amen. Praise the Lord. With the stripes, I have been healed. Jesus took up my infirmities and bore my diseases. Say it out loud. I'm healed right now. I believe I receive right now. I'm healed right now. I believe I receive right now. All right, let's pause. Say, Mr. Devil, say it out loud. Mr. Devil, your days are running me are over. You gather up all your symptoms. You take your hands off my body and you skedaddle on out of here. Jesus overcame you by the blood of the Lamb. And I overcome you by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of my testimony. And my testimony is, I am healed. I am whole. I am well. I am healed. I am whole. I am well. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, be healed. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, be healed. Receive it now. Amen. I'm healed right now. I'm healed right now. Hallelujah. I'm healed right now. Hallelujah. I'm healed right now. How not going to be now. We are the children of God. And healing is the children's bread. Now we are the Now we are the children of God. And healing is the children's bread. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now we are the children of God. And healing is the children's bread. Hallelujah. Now we are the children of God. Now we are the children of God. And healing is the children's bread. Hallelujah. I'm healed. I'm whole. I'm well. Shout it out loud. I'm healed. I'm whole. 
I'm well. I believe I receive. Hallelujah. I believe I receive. I believe I receive. I believe I receive. I'm healed. I'm well. I'm whole. Jesus took up my infirmities and bore my diseases. And with his stripes, I have been healed. I, yeah, yeah. See, she comes through smiling. She comes through happy. She comes through rejoicing. You know what you got to act like? You got to act like the work's done. Hallelujah. I said you got to act like the work's done. Hallelujah. Yeah. Glory to God. You got to act like the work's done. Hallelujah. Jesus did the work. I'm just a child. I'm just collecting what's mine. Hallelujah. I am healed. I am whole. I am well. Hallelujah. The devil's defeated. The devil's a liar. I am healed. I am whole. I am well. Hallelujah. 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 Give me a little shuffle, brother. Hallelujah. I am healed. I am whole. I am well. Lift your hands and give the credit and the glory to the Lord. I am healed. I am whole. I am well. See, here's the problem. The moment we cross over, the moment we cross over, we're going to, in a moment, we're going to know what was ours and what we left undone. And my job in the ministry <laughs> is for you to have as few tears in heaven as possible. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because my attitude is, if it's the will of God, I want it. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lift your hands up and say, thank you, Father God. You, Father God. I believe I receive, I believe I receive the healing power of Jesus Christ from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. I say with my mouth, Satan is a liar. Satan is defeated. He has no right to run me. Jesus conquered him by the cross on my behalf. I thank you, Father God. Jesus took up my infirmities and bore my diseases. And with his stripes, I have been healed. So thank you, Father God. I believe I have received. Thank you, Father God. I am healed. I am whole. I am well. Thank you, Father God. I am healed. I am whole. I am well. Thank you, Father God. I am healed. I am whole. I am well. Now I'm out of time, but stop and think about what we just did. Stop and think about what we just did. James chapter 5 says, anoint him with oil. So what did we do? We took action on the word of God. Mark 16 says, these signs shall follow them that believe in, they shall lay their hands on the sick and they shall what? They shall recover. So what did we do there? We took action on the word of God. Hallelujah. Psalm 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. So I encouraged you to not talk about the problem, but talk about the answer. Not talk about the problem, talk about the word of God. Amen. Psalm 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. So by lifting our hands and opening our mouths and praising the Lord, what were we doing? Taking action on the word of God. Now we expect signs and wonders and miracles following. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah, because we, in three different ways, we took action on the word of God. We exercised our faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And be mindful of your words because we all love an instant healing. But how do our bodies heal themselves? Generally, it's over a little bit of time. So watch your mouth, hallelujah, and just keep saying, 
Thank you, Father God. I'm healed. I'm well. I'm whole. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The devil's a liar. He's not running me. Amen. Amen. And uh, say what the word says about your life. Now let's bow our heads. You might be here this morning or you could be watching online and maybe you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord and the Savior of your life. Faith in God doesn't begin with healing. Thank God for healing. I'll tell you what, I'm very grateful for healing and I'm very grateful for success and prosperity. But faith in God doesn't begin with healing. Faith in God doesn't begin with success and prosperity. Faith in God begins by making Jesus Christ the Lord and the Savior of our lives individually and personally. Jesus said in John chapter 3, you must be born again. He said in Revelation chapter 3, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and fellowship with him and he with me. So how many this morning would say, Pastor, I have never personally and individually made Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior, but I want to do so this morning. I want to give my heart to Father God. I want to be saved. I want to be born again. I want to be forgiven of my sins. If that's you, wherever you are, lift a hand up. Lift a hand up high enough to where I can see it. We're going to pray. There may be others here this morning. You're away from God. You're not living for the Lord like you once did. We, we saw the passage this morning that we have to continue in him. So maybe you're here this morning and you did not continue in him. And you're in church, but you're not living for God. The word says in 1 John 1, 9, from this book we're studying. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How many this morning would say, Pastor, that's me, I'm, I'm backslidden. I didn't mean to do it, but I did. I'm not living for the Lord like I used to. But Pastor, I don't want to live a backslidden life, not another day. Pray for me, Pastor. I want to recommit my life to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. If that's you this morning, wherever you are, lift a hand up, lift it up high enough to where I can see it. Yes. Anyone else? If you have raised your hand for either invitation, I want you to gather your belongings up. That way you're not thinking about your stuff. I want you to gather your belongings up. Step boldly into the aisle and join me here at the front. We're going to pray. And those of you watching online, you're welcome to join in prayer with us and make Jesus Christ the Lord and the Savior of your life or recommit your life to the Lord. Well, some people are reluctant. Let's pray the prayer anyway. Father God, Time's gone by, I've gone my own way, I've done my own thing, and I've lived for self. But today I turn my life around, and I give you my life. I ask in the name of Jesus that you would forgive me of my sins. Wash me, cleanse me, purify me, sanctify me. Thank you, Father God, for not rejecting me, but for receiving me unto yourself and into your family. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. You know what we're going to do? We're going to talk to you about 1 John 1, 9 and how that, you know how many of these people are perfect? None of them. And we're going to, we'll talk to you about what we do now that we're saved. We don't have to, there, there is a time to recommit your life to the Lord. But just because you missed it or failed him, that doesn't mean we need to recommit our life to the Lord every time we go to 1 John 1, 9 and we ask for forgiveness. So we're gonna to talk to you about that. God bless you. I'm happy you're here. God bless you. Amen, let's give her, let's give the Lord thanksgiving, amen. See, some of y'all might think that Maybe it's a negative for somebody to be too sensitive to disappointing the Lord. That's not the problem in the church today. The, the problem in the church today is the other side where people just, man, they just act like, they just act like Mike Tyson and then they wipe their mouth and act like they never did anything wrong. So if somebody's a little sensitive to failing the Lord, I get it. Hallelujah. And but we're gonna work with them teach them the word of God so they'll know what to do next time. Amen. 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 Isn't it wonderful to be in a non-judgmental place? Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 